welcome to the Arlington Redevelopment Board meeting of Monday, June 15th, 2015. This is not our typical meeting. Uh, tonight we are here for a design standards presentation by David Gamble of Gamble & Associates. And I am going to, well, first, this meeting is being recorded by ACMI and also by Chris Loretti, who informed me at the beginning of the meeting that he will be recording portions of the meeting this evening. Uh, at this point, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Carol Kowalski to tell us a little bit more about what's happening this evening. Carol. Thank you. I'm Carol Kowalski. I'm Director of Planning and Community Development. Thank you very much for coming out on a very misty Monday. You're very good to come out and uh, be part of this evening. Uh, I want to tell you the purpose of this gathering. Uh, the Arlington Master Plan recommends some zoning changes in order to foster better redevelopment that fits the community's needs and desires. Generally speaking, zoning regulates uses and dimensions. In the near future, our zoning should do a better job of describing to the property owner what is allowed and what future development might feel like to the public and people next door to it and do a better job of showing what new buildings might look like on the street and on the land. Earlier this spring, we received input from the public during three tours that Gamble Associates conducted of commercial areas in Arlington. Tonight we seek to build further on that input. Once the design standards are prepared, we would then try to write zoning regulations intended to produce the community's preferred types of designs. Uh, I'm going to then turn it over to David Gamble and Brian Gregory from um, Gamble and Associates. There'll be lots of time for question and answer. Um, and I anticipate that we will probably have a question of how design standards might differ from zoning, but I'm going to hold that and let... Oh, um, so please, um, as questions come to mind, please make sure you jot them down because we really do want to hear your input. And um, I'd like to introduce David Gamble from Gamble Associates. Um, ARB member Mike Kerr points out that because ARB member Bruce Fitzsimmons had an unexpected delay in real estate closing today, it was supposed to be scheduled at 1 o'clock, we don't have a quorum of ARB members. So that means that the board can't vote or can't take action on any agenda items tonight. Okay, thanks, Mike. I think I'm going to go. Good evening. <coughs> Thank you very much for coming. I guess the absence of the one ARB member indicates how robust the development climate is at the moment in Arlington. So thanks a lot for coming again. My name is David Gamble. I'm an architect and urban planner with Gamble Associates based in Cambridge. We focus on neighborhood revitalization and community development. I'd also want to highlight Brian Gregory, a designer in our, in our office who's produced a lot of the graphics you'll see tonight. How many of you just at the outset have participated in the master planning process over the last couple of years? How many of you attended one of the public meetings? Okay, it looks like about two thirds of you. Well, I'm not assuming that you did and so part of what I want to do is just to talk about the relevance of design standards as they relate to that very uh, uh, robust and uh, remarkable effort for passing the master plan. It's actually a very important step in deciding what the future of the, uh, of the town is. I want to cover a lot, however, so if you could uh, resist the urge to ask very detailed questions, I want to give you an overview first of what design standards are. Again, not assuming that uh, you are all uh, professional designers or planners. And we're going to go over a very specific aspect of Arlington that we think can make these design standards not only precise to Arlington, but why this could actually be a model uh, for other towns and municipalities. There's, so we're, we're thinking about development that's highly place specific. And if you were involved in the master planning process, clearly the street right outside of us, Mass Ave, and in fact Broadway, these primary commercial corridors with the transit is one of those places. The Mill Brook, which is a remarkable but largely untapped uh, development opportunity and as well as the bikeway, which is, uh, again, maybe a generation ahead of its time 
and a generation from now will be even much more cherished than it currently is. These are three things that in different moments intersect along the town east to west and all hold some potential for unleashing uh, where the town can grow. Then we're going to look at a, at a, uh, a very specific example uh, along Mass Ave where we think these standards could apply and, and, and round it out by looking at some general, a general application of that. Okay, so bear with us for about 45 minutes and as Carol said, there's lots of opportunities to questions for questions. We were also, by the way, a uh, sub-consultant to RKG on the master plan, so we also participated in, in the three public meetings and were involved uh, throughout the last year and a half, uh, two and a half years. So uh, despite this might be your first introduction into design standards, uh, have no fear. I think that the, the master plan actually has uh, a lot of community engagement over that time. And what we've tried to do is identify ways in which these design standards could leverage and build off of that public engagement. Uh, Here is, as, as Carol said also in April, we, we did a bus tour, we did a walking tour. Uh, some of you here were present. Uh, Carol, it looks like they're pointing fingers at you <laughs> already. Uh, there's, it's, it's great, frankly, to work in a town where people care a lot about the fabric of that town. It's not always taken for granted. And the fact that there is such strong sentiment about what people love, what people dislike, uh, is encouraging and it's something as a consultant that we enjoy working in places like that and I hope you have uh, ideas tonight. So the f f one, two, three, four, f of the five land use recommendations, three of them actually have to do with developing a higher quality of design standards for future development. So again, this is a direct outgrowth of the master plan. We hope you see these standards as building off of that engagement uh, and help to visualize, maybe more than anything else, what design can be like in the future. So what can they do? Well, there's really, there's probably more than this, but we listed five. They improve the character of development because they actually demonstrate what is expected of developers. Okay, so first and foremost, you know, developers want to know what can they do, uh, how long will it take, what are the expectations of the town, and by developing design standards, they actually help to clarify that. That's the most important thing, actually. They raise the standard of quality, therefore. They provide examples, and we'll show you some tonight, about other cities and municipalities that we've looked at. Uh, what are the current trends in zoning? What makes sense in terms of design guidelines? Uh, a big difference is they actually help to spatialize and graphically represent what is otherwise, frankly, fairly difficult language to decipher. I mean, personally, I find zoning bylaws and ordinances uh, confusing at best, and design standards can help to clarify what those expectations are and represent them. Uh, therefore, bringing clarity to the process and in some cases, if done well, can actually expedite the process. Not always, but in some cases. And they can also go too far. Well, what does that mean? Design standards can go too far. Well, they can produce stuff like this, actually. How many of you know Seaside, Florida? OK, just a couple. Uh, well, it's one of those places that has highly detailed design standards and guidelines for every new building. On the one hand, you might say, Arlington's historic. It should actually codify and extend that design language. But you also don't want to create a, a, a Disneyland either. So one thing at the outset, I'm going to say lots tonight that will probably upset you all. <laughs> but I'll try to disperse it so not one individual is really upset. Uh, but this is one of those things that design standards aren't really about style. They can be but they can also go too far. So in other words, what does that building look like? Well, you can say it needs to have a base and a middle and a top, and the top should have a cornice, and et cetera, and et cetera. But where do you draw that line in the town's evolution? What's an appropriate date for a historical building? So embedded in the standards are some principles, but we're not suggesting that you actually codify or regulate what the building looks like per se. And I think Hopefully with some examples, you'll see what we mean by that. Uh, 
Here's what they can't do, actually, uh, despite what uh, we said in the beginning. They can't really regulate use. I mean, the zoning does that in a way, but design standards are less about that in a way than more about the expectations of design. Uh, they can't replace zoning. They actually have to be delicately feathered or integrated into the existing bylaws. For example, how do you measure a building height? Well, every town actually does it differently. And you have to make sure that when you say a building should be no more than X feet and X stories, that has to be, dealt, that has to be calibrated with the language that's used. I say height because that's usually one of the most conspicuous uh, issues in, in every place that we work. They don't actually deal with streets per se. We'll talk about a way of zoning that does, in fact, talk about the design of the public realm, but it's primarily what can a private property owner do if she wants to redevelop a property. That's really what it's about, the private property. And they don't necessarily master plan areas. Although you may wish that the Millbrook corridor got master planned, that's not essentially what these design standards do. But they help to clarify what could happen if, in fact, a developer were to come forward. And on this way, uh, this isn't a new idea. This is something that's come up in a number of times over the last, well, three years or beyond. Uh, here, uh, in fact, Andy, I think you presented this, did you not? In this room three years ago, uh, which was brilliant. It was looking at the threads between Mass Ave and the Millbrook and the uh, bike, bikeway as a place that the town should redevelop. Why? It's near transit, it's near the natural assets, it's near uh, uh, the corridor of the bike path. Cities and towns across the U.S. are looking at these corridors for recreation, for an investment, for leveraging proximity to the natural systems. This, again, is not unique to Arlington, but you have a very particular benefit because it's actually a very big area. Now, that's not all park. It's just identifying a place to develop. So it's difficult to spot zone. You don't want to say, build here, don't build here, everywhere. But you can begin to think about a way, a structure for the town's redevelopment that allows it to grow and therefore preserves what people feel are most important. So design standards can help to channel and direct where that growth should occur. And I think this is a brilliant drawing because it gets at the heart of that. Uh, go back 40 years. Almost beyond that, uh, uh, this little drawing from a Tufts, I think it was a master's thesis, in fact, that says redevelop along the Millbrook. Wouldn't that be great? Uh, with this little, little sketch. So, again, I, I take issue with the fact when people say, look, there's nowhere to build in Arlington. Arlington's built out. That's actually not true. You just have to build smarter and in the right areas. And that's why these types of uh, initiatives make a lot of sense. I mentioned that a lot of different towns and cities are, are looking at this, I'm going to call it infrastructure, although that's too simplistic of a word. What are some other places doing and why? I came back from the Atlanta Beltline a few months ago, and here's a 22-mile rail line around the entire downtown. How many of you have heard of this? Raise your hand. It's amazing. You will in about a year. Uh, it's now become a rails to trail, and they're starting very small. This is only, this is the east side trail. This is only a mile and a half, but it brings thousands and thousands of people there every day. They drive to run on the trail. <laughs> That's how much <laughs> of a benefit it is. Uh, and this is what it looked like in 2005. So they're starting small, but the grand ambition is to link this region wide. And it's, it's already brought over a billion dollars of investment in the last seven years. That's another lesson here is that this took, uh, almost 10 years to plan. Uh, the interesting thing that's when I was there is that you see all of these little industrial buildings that are turning their fronts now towards the bike path because in fact there's lots of people out there. And think of all the little buildings out there now, this is near the Mirac site, that are just waiting for that to happen. You know, small buildings, easy to do, not humongous developments, but enough to get some stuff happening. And that's, I think, a big lesson in Atlanta. Just get started. And I think there's a couple of sites where that can happen. Uh, these not being two of those, <laughs> but maybe this one. Uh, old industrial buildings that are next to these corridors that could really be something 
uh, remarkable. And in fact, reusing those buildings in ways that allow them to be celebrated. So, another paradox is the fact that new development and respecting Arlington's history can actually happen in tandem. And in fact, it's more interesting if it happens in tandem. That selectively, certain projects get redeveloped because they can be reused and celebrated like that. Uh, Green Bay, a uh, different scale, it's 100,000 people, but this is what, this is what the uh, river looked like there, the Fox River looked like there about seven years ago, eight years ago. There was a big dead mall, everything that was wrong about urban planning in the 70s and 80s uh, was inhibiting that. Just about a mile and a quarter, I think it's six blocks long of a new public realm that engages the Fox River. I mean, imagine something like that uh, here in Arlington. Uh, you don't have a river of that <laughs> dimension. I just like this image because, because it talks to programming. Because these places become interesting places that people want to visit and uh, organizations get built around this stuff to help program and, and, and uh, be a part of them. So, even at the entrance, our practice is in Cambridge. If you come from Cambridge, either on Mass Ave or Broadway, the first two things you see are things like this and this. You know, particularly at the gateway from Cambridge. You know, one-story buildings just don't cut it, <laughs> honestly. Uh, and, and, you, and they shouldn't be one-story buildings. Or the fact that major portions of the Millbrook are, are covered over, right? Uh, you know, Gold's Gym, uh, here's the Mirac. Now, these aren't, these are people who are maybe waiting for the right time. Eventually, they'll change. But if you start to stitch these things together, the hope is that the sum is greater than the parts. And so the Mirac site, I think it's, uh, she was on the bus tour, right? Uh, 20 some acres. It's not like they don't want to see something happen, but the timing isn't right. So part of it just takes uh, timing and the standards can help unleash and unlock that potential, honestly. A, a couple more, the Houston, how many of you know the Buffalo Bayou in Houston? Okay, well, it's flooded now, <laughs> uh, but they've taken into account of that with the design. This was about 15 years of advocacy on the part of people in Houston to take this sewer, it was literally a sewer, and turn it into a recreational trail. And one of the first things that the Buffalo Bayou Partnership did was they cleaned it up. And they, they had a competition for this, this little skimmer boat called the Mighty Tidy. That was, that was the... Uh, the high school students that, that uh, won the naming competition. And they had all kinds of activities that program it and get people out there and just raise the consciousness of this corridor that was really, I mean, it stunk. It was a combined sewer outflow for uh, 70 years. Uh, and so a lot of that is just the programming. And when you walk by the Millbrook now and you see, gosh, you know, parking lots, uh, uh, you know, detritus, uh, Dumpsters. I mean, you think, oh my God, just imagine how much that can change if new development addressed it in a way that enhanced it and didn't simply guard against it, right? That's what happens here when you have, you know, surface parking lots abutting and draining, in fact, into a natural resource. It's, it shouldn't happen. Uh, and this is what it looks like, you know, now. It's, again, a small part of a 33-mile vision but man, is that place active at all times of day. And it's just, it's, it's just nothing more than a Minuteman bikeway, honestly. But it connects all these neighborhoods along its length. Uh, last one, you may say, well, you know, Arlington's not that scale. It maybe doesn't quite, uh, quite match. Here's San Francisco where this highway was demolished. What are they doing now in an area where that demolished highway came down because there aren't development pressures? They took two blocks and brought in some shipping containers uh, and made that into a, an initiative called Proxy. And Proxy is just a, a, a placeholder for development yet to come. And so that's actually a fitness group that leases space by area and they program it every day. There's events that happen there, uh, a beer garden. I mean, these are literally shipping containers <laughs> uh, that people come out it's a coffee shop, there's a yogurt place, and it doesn't take a whole lot. And so you might say, how does this relate to design standards? Well, it relates insofar as it seems unimaginable today 
that there could be a corridor, the length of the Millbrook or the bike, bikeway. But if you start small with interesting projects and committed, honestly, advocacy, it can make a big difference. Uh, and actually one of the uh, members of the ARB gave us this one. I don't, didn't know this one in uh, Greenville, South Carolina, the Riverwalk. Uh, slightly different scale perhaps along that corridor, but nevertheless, wouldn't it be remarkable if you had three, four story buildings with public access, a dedicated right of way, a naturalized terraced condition that gets you down to the Mill Brook above the flood, flood plain. All of these things are possible and it really just takes standards, frankly, to regulate and anticipate that growth. Uh, just a couple more precedents specifically about design standards and how that might relate to the research to what we're doing now. In Knoxville South Waterfront, more and more towns are moving away from traditional zoning. Why? Because the character that everybody says they love is actually more about the place and the form than the use. Uses change. <laughs> an old factory becomes an office complex and it becomes a residential building. It can house high tech startups. Uses change, but the form endures. So I'm not sure where the town will go with this, but our recommendation would be thinking more about that as a paradigm as opposed to the Euclidean, as opposed to the notion of zoning residential here, industrial here, etc. More and more people have been talking about mixed use. I mean, that's really what makes a corridor active. And that requires moving away from other ways of dividing up buildings and spaces. And so in Knoxville, actually, this was a three mile riverfront, but in fact, it's subdivided because in a form based code, you can say, what is the character of that neighborhood? What is the character of this neighborhood? And design the zoning in a way to appreciate it, build off of it, embrace it, etc. And so here, there are eight different subdistricts, and they're all divided, and they all have different requirements about use, about public interface, about streets, etc. That's, that's one way in which you could think about it. And this is just a little poster that describes what the private developer can do, and then what the public sector can do in terms of uh, streets. So a form-based code, I'm sorry if this is coming across as too much of a lecture, but uh, this is an important point. It, it's different than zoning. It actually encourages greater emphasis on the public realm. It, it's about form, obviously. There is increased public engagement because if you said Arlington Heights, what is the character of your neighborhood? What is the scale? You know, what is the appropriate relationship to the street? All of that can be both elicited and formulated to allow for a character that people feel is, well, more attuned to that environment. And they tend to be highly graphic. And as designers, uh, it's something that we embrace, and you'll see some more of that here. Uh, lastly, I think the town is going to put this on the website. We did, we looked at about, how many, Brian? 20, we, we, scour, <laughs> we scoured the cities and towns to say, okay, what are the interesting things happening? Those are three of them in Milwaukee. Uh, we'll show you what they're doing here basically moving away from two-dimensional views and thinking more about perspectives. We said, well, that's kind of interesting. Let's try to do more of that because that's actually how you see things from the ground. Uh, we got this from San Antonio, uh, labeling, again, drawings more from how you perceive it and see it as a pedestrian. We also like this drawing, which is taking a, a quintessential public space in Arlington and diagramming it out so that you understand uh, there's a, a row of trees, there's a sort of interstitial zone, there's a zone for seating. You may not be able to see that from the back, but we're trying to, we're trying to better understand the character of what you have to hopefully extend it beyond today. So the, these are the three primary themes, and we hope you agree with these, but if you don't, please let us know. So the commercial corridors, and we mean primarily, Mass Ave and Broadway, although I know that there's some sub-districts that could be part of that. So we think that requires a certain relationship of the street. It, require, it demands higher density. 
more height. I know density is a bad word, but it's the best word I can think of. Uh, landscaping, open space, etc. This is a an idea that should be advanced, and I guess I need a better picture of Mass Ave. But in fact, it does look like that in quite a lot of it. One-story buildings, lots of utilities. I mean, this is a major asset, frankly, over time, and it should look different. Uh, so here's the drawing of, of those two, Broadway, Mass Ave, and the uh, areas that might be part of that. This is what everyone loves about Mass Ave, actually, or most people when you ask, do you like this? Is it okay? Well, yeah, but that's also four stories next to a two and a half story building and another two story building. So that's another dangerous thing about design guidelines is, is if you regulate it too much, everything starts to look the same and you want to make sure you embed some flexibility within that so not everything looks the same. Uh, the bikeway here. Actually, maybe a better term is the recreational trails because it's not just the bikeway there, and there's lots of perpendiculars that are important too. But notice this building, which I, I can't remember the name. That's Brigham's Alta. Brigham's Alta, okay. Uh, pretty big building. I think it's four stories, parking below grade. Brought new residents to the area. Uh, increased the tax base, all that stuff is good. But here's our problem with it, is it's set back about 50, 60 feet. Uh, so you lose that opportunity to leverage its relationship to the bike path. And if I was living there, I'd want to be able to go from my apartment out to a little bridge that gets you onto this bike path because that's how you're going to get there. Uh, why does a developer not do that? Well, maybe because it's not regulated or required or they don't receive incentives by doing so, but you can build that in. So uh, we're not saying that that's a bad piece of architecture. We're just saying its relationship to the asset or to the right-of-way is undermined. Uh, and then finally the Millbrook, which uh, we were admonished when we first presented this to the ARB because we were thinking too much about corridors. This is a, ma this is a very large area. Oh, we don't want to suggest it's just the line next to the waterway is in fact a much broader area here and it requires a lot more work on our part to better understand that. But we just want you to remember that we're thinking of these three uh, geographies is, might be the best term. And that's right near the high school. Just, I mean, just amazing potential. Okay, so with those three categories, uh, we're going to introduce seven themes. And we feel that these seven themes help to clarify how a developer would do a project along these areas. And each of these would change. But Understandably, a building setback is one of the most important things to get right. Uh, and here, just in front of not your average Joe's, great space. I probably should have got it with a lot more people. Uh, but how to, how to get that dimension right is, makes all the difference in the world. And you can, in a design standard, say any building that faces Mass Ave or Broadway needs 50% transparency at the ground floor. You can regulate that. You can require it. And in fact, you should because you want to get a mix of uses. You want transparency. You want a vibrant street life. Now here's the paradox. This in my mind is almost too much. Everything else stays the same. You've got lots of frequent entrances. You've got uh, shops. Maybe there should be more stories or certainly this. There are dozens of buildings like this along Mass Ave. It's just uh, astounding how many 1970 <laughs> buildings are set back like this and it's, it's a lost opportunity for public life, frankly. So building height, that is a major category and we will think about that in relationship to those three geographies. I'm sorry, uh, building setbacks, okay. The relationship of the private property to the right of way. Uh, the next one, and maybe we should have started with this, is the building height and again, here's that key gateway opportunity right along another major corridor. Uh, nearly every developable site is car related. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Are any of you owners of car related industries here? <laughs> no. <laughs> Maybe it's the next meeting. Uh, it's, just the, it's, just the, it's just the way things are evolving, honestly. But uh, a lot of them are, are, have lots of surface lots. And it's not that 
you know, height needs to look like this either. And we certainly wouldn't recommend 10 or 12 or 15 stories buildings like this. But a lot of it has to do with how it relates to the street and how you taper, frankly, building heights as they relate to existing neighborhoods. The rub in design, designing the right standards is relationships between things as much as you are defining the thing itself. So again, it's another paradox here because we wouldn't, you certainly don't want more of these, but how the next project relates to the existing neighborhoods, which is 90% or 80% of the territory of Arlington is really where you have to get it right. And you can do that with, with building setbacks and step backs. I hope nobody's, does anyone live in any of these? <laughs> No. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Well, again, we're modern art. Well, you know, some people like that stuff. Here's another counterintuitive thing. As much as height is important, honestly, it doesn't make as much difference as you think it does. Why? Because you perceive things from the ground. And actually, this is our office right there in Central Square. That's a one-story building next to a ten-story building. You would never want to do that. But I tell you. From the street, this is perfectly fine. It has to do with the, the use. It has to do with its relationship to the street. That's really what's most important. So don't get us wrong. We don't think a 10-story building is appropriate anywhere in, in Arlington. However, uh, I think one's fear of excessive height is often exacerbated by the worst case scenario. And if you design standards appropriately with enough specificity, then the worst case example will still be acceptable. Uh, there's only seven of these. This is number three, the public realm interface between one and the other. Again, lots of places like this. Uh, we're developing some small icons that are generic enough that people can understand what the theme is. Uh, and and we'll, we'll start to create some architecture. Don't, don't be confused by this because it could look like anything. It's more the principle of of uh, how it relates to the street. Um, Tamara probably likes this. <laughs> it's like somewhere in Holland. But there's all kinds of things like this too along uh, Mass Ave. Buildings that are suburban, that are set back from the street with easily accessible surface parking and uh, pole signs. You know, it shouldn't be allowed, period. You know, it's not appropriate in, in the, our and even here, uh, the mill building along uh, the Millbrook. Yeah, like, today, would you allow a building that close to the Millbrook? Maybe. Is this that bad? It actually works pretty great, and it's 100 years old probably. Uh, parking and access. I think for a lot of you, parking is maybe a driver. Uh, people are concerned about new development because of the negative consequences of uh, parking and access and circulation. So there's ways that you can design for that, primarily thinking about hiding the parking, um, anticipating where it can go, lowering parking standards, which actually is recommended in the master plan. Uh, and the surface parking that you do have, it's good to make sure that it's done well. And there's, I can think of four examples in Arlington where you have lots of this stuff uh, when the parking is even on the side, which is better. Or it can be in the back, but so maybe that'll grow in, but I lived in Watertown and there's a couple of these and boy, it makes a big difference. So that can also be codified. A design standard can say every single surface parking lot needs a vegetated buffer of drought, resist, drought resistant native plants, you know, period of X amount of canopy. So all of that is possible. Uh, <clears throat> another point that was reinforced at the ARB, which I, I think can't be stressed enough, is the fact that we're talking about these three geographies, but it's the cross streets between them which is really what's most, has, holds potential, those linkages between them. Uh, this is just from last weekend. I was just driving down and I couldn't believe how many opportun opportunistic paths there are to the bikeway. Uh, I mean, that can't be code compliant, right? Uh, <laughs> But imagine just a little bit more investment in those perpendiculars, linking the bike path, linking uh, Mass Ave, linking uh, the Millbrook, 
my favorite space in Cambridge is in Harvard Square connecting to JFK Park. It's only a right of way about 40 feet, but boy, do you want to walk down there because it's just a great place to be at all seasons. Or here at the Arsenal in, uh, in Watertown, again, investment in the public realm, which fosters connectivity, which leverages Arlington's greatest assets. And you can entice developers to do this. What does that mean? Well, maybe they get another story of height. But in lieu of that, they get, you get an active public realm that everybody can use. All of these things can be delineated and, and need to be, frankly. And again, I, another, I just cribbed this right out of the Millbrook <laughs> study. Uh, all of these things are, uh, have been thought about. Now is use the standards to advance that planning. One of the more difficult ones, the facades and materials. Again, I feel like the design standards should stop short of saying what a building should look like in terms of its style, but you can regulate what materials are prohibited, vinyl siding, chain link fence, etc. but you just have to give a recommendation of what its replacement is. Uh, conversely, you know, inexpensive materials can make a nicely proportioned building look really cheap. And there's a bunch of that, uh, in, uh, surprisingly <laughs> enough. And that leads directly to signage. I mean, you, you can't look at this, these buildings without thinking they could do that better or they should be doing that better. And so even a one-story building can do signage that's quite nice. It's done with uh, tastefully. It can be regulated, it should be regulated. Design standards, we're saying there is a category for signage and wayfinding that relates to these three geographies. Each one should be slightly different. Uh, and less of this. But again, here's another paradox because in some signage ordinances, things like this aren't allowed because they're actually a little too funky. And you can design standards that are too closely tailored, you know, they have to be a certain dimension, they have to be backlit, they have to be X, Y, and Z. And then you lose the opportunity for things like this, which frankly are kind of cool. And uh, another slippery slope in terms of where do you want to take these? You can do it too much and you can also not do it enough and you have to hit the right balance. Uh, so here are, uh, at the end of this, we'll give you a handout. We really want to get your feedback on what other themes do you think should make it? Are we getting these geographies right? Uh, so here's a, a handout where you can, we want you to write some stuff in, but as a, uh, as a transition to how might these overarching ideas relate to, uh, to, the main, to the main corridors, these are three initial concepts of uh, buildings that relate to these seven categories uh, along the commercial corridors. I know it's too tall. <laughs> well, bear with us. We can, we can uh, uh, find an appropriate dimension, but we actually think four to five stories is not too much density along Mass Ave and in fact along portions of Broadway. By doing so, it alleviates pressure in other areas and therefore uh, think of it as a release valve. And if it's done well and that with the right uses, with transparency and the right signage and the nice facades and set step backs, which above a certain story, you, you set back 10 to 12 feet, makes all the difference in the world. A building's height will come down visually from the street. Uh, these are principles that should be adhered to of buffers with adjacent residential areas. So this is just the first pass at how we might start to, to represent this. Uh, bike paths might be difficult to read the lime green in the back, but this would be a better place, this would be a better place at the bike path if there were connections to smaller scale buildings that were set back from that space, which I believe is owned by DCR, by uh, uh, MBTA. M MBTA owns that, but nevertheless, there's a right of way on either side of that center line where buildings actually could engage it. Um, again, connections to the next adjacent corridor or the Millbrook where if one used, and this is the challenge here because the topography changes so much along the town, but 
if you leveraged the topography as it relates to the Millbrook, you can actually bring development up to a level that's both safe because it's outside the floodplain, but allows for a public space adjacent to it. So two to three stories we think is an appropriate height for new development. If it's less than that, there'll be less interest in development, frankly. It can be done well. And look, that's probably a 75 foot setback uh, from the center line of the water course. Would every development look like this? Absolutely not. But maybe there's a way to start to visualize how development should occur. Okay, I feel like I'm going on too long. <laughs> uh, just two more, two more points. One is a very specific example, uh, and I've covered up the name to protect the innocent <laughs> here. Uh, but it's, there's all kinds of projects like this, not in just in Arlington, but in many places. A large surface parking lots uh, set back from the street. This is in Mass Ave. Um, so between Spy Pond and Mass Ave, just half a mile from here, uh, that's what it looks like today. So we're just going to show you a few images that uh, hopefully relate to these themes. So you don't want to do that. That's looking south towards Spy Pond. What could it look like? <laughs> Uh, well, again, bear with us, but you would want to put density along Mass Ave. You want active commercial uses. The colors represent housing is yellow, office could be blue, and red is retail or commercial space. Now, any developer who comes forward would choose whatever uses they feel they can get away with or uh, make sense, but there is a desire to increase the commercial tax base. You could imagine residential there, but you could also imagine a series of buildings, and here's the key that make a connection from Mass Ave to the Spy Pond, because you just can't get there from here. Uh, what that would mean is that, well, the guideline actually says connecting corridor, the Spy Pond, or connecting the water system to Mass Ave should have a public space of a certain dimension, and that would help to structure a project like this. On the other side from the bike path, this is what you see. Well, this is what you see. Um, it's probably one of the most spectacular potential views in the town, uh, but you're looking at the backside of a, of a suburban commercial space. Now, Walgreens doesn't know that we're looking at this, but you have to think that if you drive down Mass Ave, this space should be something different. You know, it could look like something like this, which is to say, as the building relates to a natural water course, it tapers down in height. And this would allow for a cafe, uh, some type of uh, amenity space, a terrace, uh, steps. But here's this path. And as, as a planner, frankly, this is maybe, maybe more important than the, what the architecture looks like. You're creating a linkage that's publicly accessible and beautifully designed upon which development actually helps to relate to. Uh, so that's, you know, that's the view from, from that, or be better than this because you'd be higher. It's fascinating along Mass Ave that you see the towers. They're usually civic buildings or religious buildings, but they help to create points of interest and they terminate views. At this site, Mass Ave actually cur bends around from Cambridge towards Arlington Center. It has a bend to it. That would be a place to put height. The design standard should say additional height might be warranted to terminate a view corridor. We've written that in other instances. And so this is an instance, this is why we think five stories at that location could be allowed, because you're actually site specific, you're creating a linkage that relates to, uh, you know, you'd see the fire station off in the distance here. So it would, it would create a series of nodes along the commercial corridor, which is why we think additional height here could be warranted. And it could look something like this. And, you know, actually we've left out, Carol will scold me later because we didn't make it look more historical. <laughs> uh, it could look like anything. I mean, it could, it could have uh, slope pitches and everything. We just drew what we're used to. And so don't, don't get too upset about the contemporary architectural expression. It wouldn't look like that. And then lastly, if you're looking east towards the gas station, this is the gas station. Here's the Walgreens site. That's what it looks like now. Uh, 
That's five stories, which honestly is not too tall. And this site should actually have that amount of height, we believe. And so because of that, if you allow that height, you can get something like this. Uh, because developers will be incentivized to create public connections that they wouldn't otherwise be required to do. And so that's why, that's the quid pro quo. That's the, if you do this, you get that. Uh, but the that is actually pretty remarkable. So here's why, here's the terrace overlooking Spy Pond. Here's a, maybe a commercial use. Legal test kitchen, I mean, it's like there should be a, a, a great restaurant or bar there. Not bar, uh, something there. It's not bar. Bar's good. Bar, bar's good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so again, just a little cartoon, um, you know, that, that could look like. As a way to summarize, and then we do have a couple questions to ask you uh, anonymously, and we want to maybe use that as a transition to getting some feedback. So this is not a place-specific instance of where the design standards relate to a project, but it models the manner in which a development might move forward. Uh, again, a corner site, here's a major road, that could be the bike path. Um, a traditional developer is going to come in and propose something like this, which is to say, this is happening in Watertown where I live, a CVS right on the major corner of a major road. Uh, a surface parking lot, pole sign, setback, that's maybe a five, 7,000 square foot commercial building. Uh, immediately, that needs to come up to the street edge. That's like rule number one, public realm interface. It addresses the street. Uh, parking goes to the rear. Number two, there's shared parking. Parking should actually be shared across sites and not just looked at the individual uh, properties. You share parking, thereby alleviating the parking burden Office uses and residential uses overlap. You can, you can calibrate that. Uh, you actually increase density, and maybe that's enough to get parking below the building, or maybe the topography allows for parking underneath. You set it back a certain distance because this is an intersection. So step backs are setbacks above a certain floor. Set backs are the distance to the street. You require that. Uh, you you modulate the building massing so it's not one 180 foot long facade. You uh, create variation in the building elevations. Uh, you recommend a certain material palette. You ensure that it's highly sustainable and that alternative energy sources are used in the project's implementation, solar, geothermal. Uh, materials again, and that the landscaping, which always comes at the end, the landscaping is related to the building and it's not thought about as, a, as an extra, but the landscape and the building form actually are designed synergistically. Um, okay, uh, I see a question. We do want to ask you some very specific questions if we can, if we may. I'm not sure what time is it. Where it's, can, can we just, uh, you pass out some handheld clickers and we'll, it'll only take about 10 minutes and then we'll go into questions. Can you wait? Okay. Uh, right there. So I think most of you are probably familiar with these handheld devices. Uh, use them at town hall? Use them at town meeting. Yeah, town meeting, okay. They were really cool about six or seven years ago. <laughs> they they kind of lost their allure because of more people have them, but you'll, you'll see how they work very quickly if you're not familiar. I'm going to just make it quick enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do now have a quorum of ARB members, so the ARB is in session. <laughs> Don't press any buttons yet. <laughs> okay. We did this uh, a year, a little, just about a year ago for a visual preference survey as part of the master plan. It was actually very helpful. We'll also post this online to get more people's feedback. Okay, uh, so the way it works is uh, there's just five questions here. Please choose the most appropriate answer 
It's like the ACT, everything might be right, but you have to choose the best one, <laughs> okay? So uh, what are your expectations for the design standards? Uh, vote one if you think they will raise the quality of new development. All right, is anyone pressing? No. Can you define what you mean by expectations? Do you mean what we expect will happen or what we desire to happen? Uh, good question. What was the question? What, what you desire to have happen. Versus what we expect will really happen. <laughs> 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 oh, okay, hold on. Let me do this again here. See, I didn't know the answer, so I just stopped. <laughs> you know, uh, so I pulled this code and my laptop died and I had to rent a new laptop and the software that we installed here is new. So we can take a break, we can just restart the computer and then you know, if, if you guys want to do these questions, we can continue. Can we do that? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important and, and very helpful if anyone would be able to, to get your input on these questions. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Carol, I'm going to have to start. Just don't leave, please. <laughs> 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 So we're just going to restart the computer. I think that's the issue because the program is new on the computer. Can you require green roofs or can you incentivize green roofs? Absolutely. Uh, sustainability could be its own category here, but we left it out as its own category because we think it's embedded in every other uh, of the seven. But yes, that is exactly something that you can say a developer with a green, you know, that's an incentive. If they give you a green roof, you can, you know, whatever. Oh, I think they asked us to. Yes, yeah, yeah, as long as we have a break, I just asked a question. So I'm still fundamentally confused about the process. So, um, stores that are single story now, suppose they want it to stay there, so they didn't want to knock it down. They wanted to add something to it. Is the reason they're not doing it now because just because of zoning issues, or is it a financial issue? I mean, what would we have to provide additional incentives in, in that direction? Right. So, so why <coughs> isn't it happening now? So the question is, why do you still have so many one-story buildings right. along Mass Ave? Right. It, it's a variety of factors. Primarily, as there may be multiple property owners along what would otherwise be a single development project. So someone would have to go in and actually aggregate multiple properties together in order to create the density. When we asked in the visual preference survey what people liked, nearly everybody said the Capitol Theater. Great, but that has no parking. Right? So a developer may not propose to do, other than on-street parking, the width of the parcel is not deep enough to accommodate a surface lot or you can't get the density to park it, to self-park it below grade. So a developer is not incentivized to build a new building because they feel they can't park it and they think that everybody needs to park. I just don't get what are the incentives then for these existing, I mean they have to, all degree to sell their buildings to some developer that's going to knock it down or do, is there any way for somebody to say I just want to add a couple stories up here and throw some apartments up there? The answer is yes. If a developer thought that she could build right outside is a, one, a series of one-story buildings across from town hall you know, that, and uh, including a, a drive-in bank <laughs> like that should not be across from the most impressionable building in the town. How, how do you incentivize that? Well, first of all, you develop standards that encourage it. 
you in incentivize it, you lower parking standards so that developers don't feel they have to meet all their parking on site. Uh, it may require multiple properties to be aggregated together. Linkages to the Millbrook, you know, should be made. There are things that need to be described that can help clarify and incentivize. So let, well, Question. There are examples um, where if a building is structurally sound and can support additional um, stories, um, a, a building in Austin recently added stories and kept its existing first floor. I've seen it done in other uh, cities and towns. It depends on the building and it depends on the owner's intentions, but it can be done. Who owns the Millbrook right now? The land along the Millbrook is owned by many, many property owners. So right to the center line of the waterway? To tell you the truth, I don't know of, uh, the answer about the water course itself. I, I, I think I can find out for you, but the important uh, part is that we, there are many landowners who own the land right along the edge of the border. And is it clean water? It depends on your definition. It's, it's for the most part clean. It's, it's, I don't think we have a lot of uh, 21 east sites along, uh, after 21 east sites along the work. Okay. I have another question. <clears throat> I might be coming to this a little late, but can you just describe where in the process these design standards are right now? Is this, yeah, just where, where in the approval process, the, all of that? Right now, they're still being prepared. Okay. That's why input is so important. Uh, th there are categories that ha have been proposed, and you'll probably hear a little bit more about those categories. Um, one, one category is parking, one category is signage. Uh, we will very likely have a survey monkey online for input as well as doing um, presentations like tonight's. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're not etched in stone by any means. But has, has the town decided that they will implement some design standards? It's just unclear what those will be? That's correct. There okay. is a recommendation in the master plan to adopt design guidelines. We wanted to do the design guidelines before zoning because the design guidelines should really inform and be part mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. So the public and property owners know what to expect and what things will look like and should look like. Um, two points, but one is first the question. Will the design guidelines be submitted to town meeting for approval or endorsement or something? What I'm hopeful that they will be worked into a zoning bylaw amendment which will go to town meeting. If yes, yeah, so yes. The second the second point is uh, the Capitol Theater, everybody likes the Capitol Theater, that uh, everything considers parking situation. Uh, but that doesn't mean you want the whole avenue aligned with the Capitol Theater type of thing. That's right. And I, I just I could ask you to think of this image. Think of Mass Avenue. Think of Mass Avenue in Lexington. Think of Mass Avenue in Cambridge. Now, which do you like better? I don't I don't think that's what we have to I don't think we have to choose between those two. I think there's a lot in between. And I think that that's very important to provide some flexibility for creativity and for what works on a site in Arlington. I, I, I don't disagree with that, but, but there's a lot of the developers you know, basically don't care. They, they like the Cambridge or not, bigger and better. Um, those of us who are more, you know, just aesthetically, I don't think you can drive past into, very far into East Lexington and say, well, I don't think it used to look like this before we went crazy with all these commercial developments. Isn't it nice? That's all that's it. <coughs> Just to interject or add to that, the way that the design guidelines can help to be maybe a little site specific is that, in effect, is that you guys do sit sort of between these two paradigms and, and continuing on through Cambridge and end up in Boston. And so 
there is sort of these thresholds that you meet and, and you guys sort of fit in one of those steps. And so I do think perhaps further up towards the heights you start to get towards the character going out towards towards that, but, but down towards the mind piece side or down towards what Hilton is closer to Cambridge, the development might be different. And I think that's that's the rub of design guidelines in a way, is to try to describe these corridors so that you get a, sort of a continuous transition that's appropriate for sort of your proximity to the metropolitan area or rural conditions. So that's that site specificity that you sometimes don't get with zoning that you can get with design guidelines or that they want to achieve. So you can, you can sort of dictate different heights, setbacks, so that the character transitions as you go along. Uh, great example, perhaps not for the buildings, but for the changing character is, is Route 1 North, you know? You start out, it's very urban, and you end at the tops field, and it's not, and, and you don't necessarily want, you know, that fills up steakhouse. But I think the idea is that a road can have a lot of different characters, and that a gradual transition is, is desirable. Uh, while we're waiting, there is a question back here. Uh, yeah, actually, to uh, mention his question was, um, do you have a timeline for this kind, this uh, these design standards to be implemented? Is, is there like a general like year or so that you want to have these like written out and and implemented into new projects? We have a few milestones. Okay. By the end of this month, we hope and expect that we will have a product. Oh, thank you. Sorry. By the end of this month, we will have some um, draft, at least, of these guidelines to work further on. We, I'm hopeful, in, a, in, in the best case, I'd very much like to have something ready for town meeting next year. Next year? Okay. With a zoning change. That's, that's going to take a lot of work. It's very ambitious. I have a question. Um, you know, before there was the master plan, there was the what's it called the economic development study. Um, now talk about three commercial centers along Mass Ave. Uh, I'm hearing more of a commercial corridor. Uh, I have a question whether the town can support commercial development along the entire road of Mass Ave. Um, it doesn't seem to me right now that we have a lot, um, a huge demand for commercial uses on the first floor. A lot of parts of Mass Ave. And as you know, when you get these new developments, they're always going to be charging price rents for that commercial space. Um, I'm concerned that we start going this route, and there seems to be this desire that every building on Mass Ave has commercial use on the first floor, that uh, you're going to have a lot of vacant storefronts. I don't, I don't think that, and I, and I hope that it, we won't have anything that asks for the whole length of Mass Ave to have the same um, quantity of commercial necessarily or the same range of mixes. I agree with you. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's what this will achieve or, or seek to achieve. I think in respects of commercial as well. It's, yeah. it's not just retail, it's, you know. Office is. Office and, and shared workspace. And, and right now we have a very low, um, vacancy rate in office. Uh, we're at a point where typically new office development would be triggered, so office could be appropriate in some areas, um, more appropriate in commercial and others, and a mix of uses and others. And in some parts of Mass Ave, it may be appropriate to kind of leave it, leave it as it is. Yeah. I think I could maybe add to that. I think one of the nice things that design guidelines can do is be both a carrot and a stick. I think that if you were to look at zoning, it tends to be more the stick. You shall not do this. You will not do that. You cannot be told to do this. And I think what David was alluding to earlier with the sort of flexibility is that you can go back and forth. So you're sort of using both. So um, to your example earlier about both you know, green roofs and solar, I think one's a carrot, one's a stick effect sometimes. You can demand a stick that people do a solar assessment for their property. And then they can have a conversation with the town. But the onus falls on the developer to do that. Uh, the carrot mentality would be in terms of a green roof. Well, maybe a percentage of that counts towards your open space or permeability requirements. And so it changes, you know, maybe a little much of the, how much of the site can be developed or, or there's sort of trade-offs like that. And, and in a similar way, I agree, you can overdo commercial and that would be the worst, but 
design guidelines can maybe talk about instead of use the level of transparency. So it's more about incentivizing a public use because above a certain level of transparency, you, you, you can't put housing there. It would just, no one wants to sit behind a glass window on the street. So the hope would be it incentiv incentivizes maybe, uh, maybe there's a community space. The developer, if they're required to do that, says, okay, I'll, I'll give the front of the building, it's programmable for community art, or it's, um, we allow certain setbacks, maybe if you have outdoor seating, so that makes it worthwhile to have a cafe because they can gain some of the sidewalk space. So, so I don't know if that answers it exactly, but I, th I think it's that level of flexibility and allowing the conversation between the town and developer to happen that hopefully leads to a, a better result than being overly prescriptive. So how are we doing, David? It's <laughs> <laughs> a nice blue screen. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's not gonna come up. It's, it's, uh, it's a program issue. No. Uh -huh. No, so I, I apologize. It's, of course, uh, you do it 100 times in the one time. But uh, so here are the questions, actually. What are, what are your main concerns about new development? Are you, do you feel, so let's just let's ask you that, OK? What is your biggest concern about, what's your biggest anxiety? Is it the amount of new development? Is it the scale of the buildings? The quality of the public realm, or the lack of a coordinated vision. So moving forward, knowing that the development pressures will increase, of those, new development, the scale of buildings, the quality of the public realm, or the, maybe the lack of a coordinated vision. Which one are you most concerned about, or is there something else? Yes. So my biggest concern is how to make Mass Ave more walkable and feel more friendly and neighborish, neighborly, foot-ish. Um, it's really fun to walk through Lexington from, you know, for many blocks. There's benches and there's little trees and there are cafes and there's a lot of, the, everything looks really nice. Um, East Arlington is pretty good, and it's going to be a lot better after the project is done. But as far as from here up to the heights, it's basically a throughway. You just drive through. It, it's really not pleasant to walk from here to the heights, even for those of us who like to walk. It's a nice distance. Um, what would make it better? I don't know. Maybe having <coughs> pocket parks along the way, maybe having benches along the way some cafes, so I wonder, as part of the guidelines, maybe, maybe you talked about this under maybe public realm interface, I got here late, um, it, is there a concept of, if somebody's gonna be putting up a building, what can they add to the public space mm -hmm. between the building and the road to make people wanna walk along now? Okay, Carol, can we hand, did we hand these out? Can we pass these out? I think that that is, that is one of the most important issues to get right. And the thing is, not every, spa not every space is well used or well programmed. So if you allow a developer to maybe build another story because they create a pocket park, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that over time it may not be as public or as well maintained as you actually had hoped it would be. And, and so therefore, where do you regulate additional open spaces? How big are they? How do you ensure that a developer will continue to maintain it or, or the town will maintain it? It's a great question and unfortunately it's very difficult to identify because if you, if you say you will be given an additional story, for example, I use that example because it's maybe the most often cited. You can, if you create a half acre park, you can build another story. Well that one half acre park may not be appropriately sited, or it may not be as lush as one would want it to be. So it's, it's the right question to ask. Unfortunately, it's just one of a series of decisions that will ultimately make it clear whether or not it's a good project or not. Well, I mean, I guess the bottom line is how you make the walk from here in the heights more pleasant yep. 
as a result of the design standards? Would those would there be any relationship between those two? Things? Yes, and I think it's the public realm interface that's maybe most critical to get right. Because if you're walking by surface parking lots and one story buildings and and it's not a very pleasant place to walk, you're not going to do it. Other thoughts about things you're anxious about as it relates to development, not <laughs> in general. Yes. Um, I just to add um, thought it would be important to note that um, a, a lot of times uh, it's overlooked that um, when new developments are created, the uh, driveways to them will be very close to intersections, which causes a lot of um, uh, backups and uh, like frustration with people because they people are coming in, you have to keep track of way too much while at the same time. So I feel like it might be important to add to some of the design standards that any driveways should be a certain amount behind the intersection so that there's enough time for the decisions to be made without interfering with traffic in the actual intersection. That's a great point. Curb cuts are, are death knells to pedestrian movement. And the Walgreens site has four curb cuts <laughs> over the course of probably 400 feet. So at most there should be one and if so it should be designed well. Yep, good point. Yes sir. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I hope this is uh, I, I hope this, uh, this I hope it's okay to move off of Mass Avenue and Broadway for a minute in the Mill Brook. The, but in terms of design guidelines, one, one of the big problems, and you ask people in the, na in the residential neighborhoods, the big problem that they're facing is they tear down a little house next door and put up some monstrosity. And there, there are zoning methods of controlling this. For some reason Arlington has done nothing to control it. And uh, maybe it's design guidelines, maybe it's just more zoning. But uh, from what I hear around town, People aren't worried about how many new shops they're going to have in Mass Avenue or how high the, 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 the building is going to be that's going to happen on Broadway. They're, they're worried about their own block and, and how did that horrible big thing get there and put shadow on my garden and so on. Again, that's another great point. I might should have maybe underscored at the beginning these guidelines are looking primarily at those three geographies, knowing full well that 80% of the town has these development pressures. It's, it's unfortunately, it's, this is an inadequate answer to your question, but it's outside of our scope to address the McMansionization or the teardown. I think ultimately the town's gonna have to address it and sooner rather than later, that's not part of what we're looking at, unfortunately. Why is that? <coughs> I, I, I'd like to try to answer that if I may. The Arlington Master Plan has uh, uh, over 100, I think 140 recommendations. Uh, several of them do address uh, residential development. One of them is to develop de design guidelines. So Gamble Associates' contract was to work on the design guidelines for the commercial areas, Millbrook and the, um, but uh, I, I hope you will follow the implementation of the Master Plan, so please stay in contact, check the website. No wonder. Um, you had four comments or five comments on there. What was, yeah. the, what was the last one, if you will? Other. <laughs> Next to that, one up. A lack of a coordinated vision. Okay. Are you anxious about that? Yes. yes. The way I interpret that is do nothing. Now, is that exactly what you're shooting for? Because I'm not sure that we're trying to accomplish much if we just sit back and don't do much. I would much rather see some progress along Mass Ave, whether it's, whether it's walkable or not. I'm not, at my age, it's not, never gonna be walkable. But, um, you know, there's, there's obviously some things that could be done along both Mass Ave and Broadway that would enhance what we are seeing now. And we saw that in those walks that we did last April. You could see some wonderful examples of what could be done very yeah. nicely. But I, I guess if I had my druthers, I'd scratch out that one that says do nothing. Because okay. I don't think that's where we, we I don't, we, think, I don't think that's where we should be going. 
Yes, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a throwaway. The last thing you want to do is have a moratorium, even if it's legally possible in some ways. Uh, you need a, a good test demonstration project that follows the design standards. A modestly scaled, implementable, well-designed first project that says, look, we can do this, even if it's just one small half of a block, because that will encourage other developers to follow suit. So I, my concern, um, I guess, would be parking, um, and not the quantity, but actually the way that when you get a certain amount of density, which I personally totally support, um, it ends up building, having this parking problem with sites where when you develop them in incrementally, mm -hmm. that suddenly just doing what you were drawing where you have some sort of commercial and then you know, the housing on top or the office on top, which is all great, it makes the whole street more vital, um, requires the parking that you can't get on the site and so it actually turns around and de-densifies mm -hmm. everything that you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. And so back to the lack of coordinated vision, I think the opportunity here of thinking about sites not just as individual pieces but as how they can work together, mm -hmm. maybe there can also be some sites that are thought about more as, you know, as it densifies, you'll have some structured parking or something that'll alleviate, you know, that will allow the residents to have a place to park or just, I think parking is just a real conundrum for towns like ours where somebody, you know, people do have cars, but you don't want to drive down the d density to such a degree mm -hmm. to make the ratios work. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah, the Walgreens site does in fact have a slope of about 12 feet from north to south, which would allow below grade parking essentially, which would then encourage greater height. But it, there's no parking structure in Arlington, is that correct? Not a single one. Not, no, no public. No, yeah, lot. yeah. Behind the, behind the, behind the warehouse building in most cases. There's two levels. I, I mean, the way that someone said they loved walking down Lexington, it's definitely because it was planned so yeah. that all the development is along the street and all the parking is in the back. Yeah. And that, the only way that happens is if you aggregate a certain amount of sites in order to get that big parking lot. And you know the way to solve parking is not to provide for more of it. You know, developers are actually finding that they don't need as much as they thought they would because if they live along a transit corridor, not everyone needs 1.5 cars per bedroom. You know, it's just it's it's actually going the opposite trend. Yes. Yeah. So actually, I have a question about how design standards relate to affordability, and so I. I actually have some friends who've had to leave Arlington because it's, it's so expensive. And I, I think building new development is one way to address that, and along the Mass Ave corridor is the right place to do it. Um, I guess my question is, what can we do with design standards to help encourage uh, developers to, to put in units that are affordable, you know, whether it's smaller units, whether, you know, and maybe parking plate, you know, requiring less parking plays into that, mm -hmm. but also not having design standards that encourage such a high I mean, we want, we want good looking development, but not such a high quality that, you know, people are priced out all over the place. Yeah, it's, uh, that's another good point. Um, you can incentivize smaller units, which will attract, uh, you know, a different demographic and maybe rec and alleviate some of the burden with, with, uh, with costs associated with bigger units. I mean, Arlington is a very desirable place, as you know, <laughs> look, just look at the school enrollments, right? So. Uh, it can be, it's one of the carrots that Brian talked about, uh, allowing a certain percentage of units that are not just uh, affordable, but a certain size that will help to lower the number, the cost. Our inclusionary zoning obviously addresses that with new development. Our inclusionary zoning obviously addresses that uh, as well. And uh, um, it would be great for developers to do more. Uh, there's no question about that. It is um, very desirable, but it has to be enforced. 
In fact, developers have found ways around that occasionally, and it's not enforced by our um, powers to be to an adequate ex extent, especially with small developments of around six where it kicked in. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot depends on the, on the officials and their willingness to oversee and enforce standards of all kinds, which is not being done right now, yeah. including in small uh, development. And you're not alone in that respect. The design standards will only be as strong as the mechanisms to enforce them. And most municipalities do not have a design review process, uh, as I say, an outside design review process. We ask developers to do extra tran transportation planning scenarios. How often is it design? Well, much less. So part of the effectiveness of these design standards will be the way in which they get enforced by the town to ensure that they're met or encourage the developers to do the right thing. Uh, it can be new staff. It can be outside uh, review bodies, usually an architect or a planner or landscape architect. It can be a consortium of people to review projects of a thir certain threshold above 10,000 square feet, you know, mixed uses, you can regulate that. That's actually part of, this needs to be discussed because this is part of the implementation is how, how will they projects be reviewed and by whom? So is, it, is it part of the special permit process? Or it, it, it can be. Yeah. It can be. Or the town can simply say any project of a certain size will now go through design review and you have a checklist with the design standards. Okay public realm interface, um, parking ratio lowered, et cetera. It's, it's, uh, you try to make it as less, least discretionary as possible. Can you bring your um, presentation up again? Or do you Probably lose not. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. Okay. I wanted to ask you about your, your vision for the Walgreens site, oh, okay. in part because I live very close to it. but. Uh, but you know, one of, somebody asked about parking, and when I looked at that, I said, well, where's all the parking for all that space? Well, just, um, I know we've talked a bit about parking and in terms of the buildings and um, you know, facades and public areas. Uh, one thing I don't think we've talked about very much is just how the buildings and you know the related stuff around them integrates with transit. So it's I know that um, Ms. Stamps would like to walk to places and she might like a bench to sit down on if she gets there a little early. Uh, I tend to commute by bicycle. Um, I think there's room to improve public transit in Arlington. Uh, there are three main bus routes and. To be honest, they haven't gotten, they haven't really, they've kind of gone downhill over the last couple of years, at least in my experience. Um, there's, it would be nice to, you know, not just to think about the pla places as destinations where people want to go, but also take into account how people are getting there. Uh, because we did do this as a test case, it's, there's more information here than you could decipher, but we didn't go into it. There's, all of this is basically on a parking plinth. You park underneath, par, par, part of this development is you sneak in behind here and there's about 75 spaces that are essentially below grade because this site slopes 13 feet from north to south. There's an additional 20 some spaces here. And it works because if a developer were to propose this project, each of these buildings actually has a core that comes up from the below grade parking or the deck, if you think of it just one level, that gets you into these buildings. So it could be phased or you can access each of these from below. Uh, it, it just works on this site because of the grade change. Number one. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, I didn't determine that, but this is probably, it's probably comparable. Are you, are you then shrinking the commercial space quite a bit in your new development? I believe this is about 20,000 square foot 
uh, Walgreens, which is a medium-sized footprint building of this type of use. We have 18,000 square feet of red and purple here. So it's just a little bit less. Uh, uh, the red is retail commercial space. I think we've added this as well, which could be a um, restaurant or another type of public use. Your question is, does this project, as it's drawn, meet all of the parking requirements for the uses that we've shown? I would probably say it doesn't meet all of it, but it's probably pretty close. So the question is, if the town would be willing to reduce the, the parking requirement for these units because you happen to be right along a major bus corridor or a bike path, so it's not 1.25 per unit, but 1 or 0.75, it might actually pencil out. I, I'm actually less concerned about what the requirement is in the Bible than what the requirements for viability. And, and that's, you know, as I said, that is a concern I have. Um, and I guess another concern, more generally, about these types of things is that planning tends to go in trends. You know, we talked about the 70s and 80s. I mean, I, I'm certainly old enough to remember when Bird and Ball were going to get rid of the cars and they you know, pedestrian friendly were all the rage. And how many of those have been taken away because they led to dead zones in the middle of the cities? And I, I have a real fear about that. Um, that maybe to some respect we're going to be going too far and reversing things like we're reversing Broadway Plaza. That was, that was I'm sure, very trendy at one time. Um, how, do we, how can we be sure we're not coming back? Uh, well, it's a, kind of, it's a very good question. And you know, every generation is quick to criticize the previous generation, right? But undeniably, what's attractive to people of all ages is to be in environments that have a mix of uses, that have relationships to public open space networks, that leverage, open, that leverage existing spaces like Spy Pond, like Millbrook, that are within walking distance to commercial centers. I'd like to believe that those are timeless. It's certainly what people have said they cherish here. And this site, because it's a five minute walk from Arlington Center, demands more than what's there. I think also, uh, to your point a little bit with this development, is uh, what Tamara was also speaking to, is a holistic sort of view of how a site is used. So uh, the parking ratios are usually sort of siloed. You know, commercial has this, residential has this. And what David alluded to earlier is, if there's a restaurant use here, Assumedly, it has the inverse parking needs of the blue, which is the sort of office space. You typically leave office, go to that. So the idea would be, and, and this hasn't been tested in this one precisely, the onus would be on the developer, but there may be incentives for the developer to do these types of plans where, and these sort of rubrics exist, to sort of test the needs so that at any given time they're satisfying the, the sort of parking demands of the site uh, but not overparking a building because they're anticipating them all being online at once, which is mildly uh, implausible. Yeah, I just wanted to um, say a couple of things about thinking about the corridors. I think it's a great it's it's a great way to think of um, the town of Arlington because there are three very distinct corridors or or linear forms that pass through the town. Uh, I think we. We tend to, when we look at maps and so on, we tend to think of, of these corridors as proceeding from one end to the other, almost like, like the lady back there, thinking about walking from here to the heights or so on. And I actually think of, of these corridors more in terms of how they, uh, sort of their gravitational effect, how they pull from the residential neighborhoods surrounding, and which is why I think your, your um, idea or your interest in the connections and the, the, uh, the way that you get to the corridors is, is very important, and the public realm along the corridors. Um, I think probably maybe only a few people will actually walk the length of Mass Ave, but a lot of people may walk from their house out to Mass Ave and walk a block one way and maybe a couple of blocks the other way and then go back home. And so that's kind of, it's, it's a different experience, but, it, but it, it's um, the quality of that public space and along the street is, has to be able to be varied enough and interesting enough and, and personal enough that it will 
draw folks from their residential neighborhoods, or if you're thinking of, for example, the Mill Brook, that there's something that draws people to it and away from it. Of course, there's always, you know, there's always the big dilemma of, of the speed at which you uh, experience one of these corridors. So if you're driving, you probably don't want all these pedestrians crossing in front of you and so on. But at the speed that people live in, in their, and walk, it's a very different experience. So those are, I think they're just, it's, it's very, you know, it's very good um, kind of gnarly problem to deal with is the, the, uh, those interfaces. So. Oh, yeah. I, I do want to say also, one of my fear, the fears or my uh, biggest concern about the master planning is, um, is manifested, or in, in the design standards is manifested in the movie Back to the Future, or maybe it was Back to the Future 2, where That's you, yeah, where you see, you know, you go, I think, I think Marty goes into the future, if those who are as big a fans of Back to the Future as I am. Marty goes into the future and Biff has, you know, taken over and there's Biff Industries, Biff is the bully, you know. And so everything is just awful and overdeveloped and so on. It's an interesting movie, to, a series of movies to watch in terms of urban design and urban, urban sort of evolution about how wrong things can go, you know, and then also looking backwards at, you know, the little country lane that became a, so uh, I'd recommend looking at Back to the Future. But this is, I, I don't want to gloss over it. I think this is a very difficult problem. And as much as we talk about the corridors, they change, it's episodic, uh, one size doesn't fit all. What we're trying to do is, is advance, actually, what's been thought about before and represent it in a way that entices development to achieve the principles that people outlined in the master plan. That, that is the bottom line, I think, that one could aspire for. I don't think that every developer is going to, uh, it's not, it won't be a one size fits all. I think it's too, too episodic. It's, it depends on too many variables. But if you can, again, take, is it Old Colony? The, like if a project like that, that's a lot of surface parking, that's low density, that's big enough that a developer can uh, you know, sink their teeth onto it. If you do one right and it, it, it touches these that it, where they get really close, it could unleash a lot um, fiscally, physically, environmentally. I was just wondering how the town can incentivize that kind of development to happen because right now there, it's individual landowners and you know if, if the you know numbers work for them as it is you know unless they they change his hands you know it may be just easier to leave it as is and i'm just wondering in, in these do, doing the guidelines is there some more incentive that would sort of engage some of these properties that are just sort of dormant because they're working for the owner right now Right now, we have uh, setback requirements that um, wouldn't get what, wouldn't achieve what we understand the community wants. Our zoning was um, overhauled in around 1974, 72, 74, and uh, what the community desires now isn't found in the dimensional requirements, the site. Um, setback requirements. Uh, so one of the things that can be done is to change the zoning, uh, very simply. But I, I think, as I said earlier, I think it's very important to do this first uh, and to fold this into the zoning. And uh, I, I will say that it's a bit of a chicken and an egg. You can, a developer won't do this because it's illegal at the moment. <laughs> so you have to change the zoning. But you can bring a developer along on board and do a test case and demonstrate how you can achieve a certain density that you wouldn't get otherwise and overlap the two. We actually just did this in Watertown. We took a 300 unit housing project and related it to design standards and guidelines, improving the project, keeping the same number of units, but, but meeting all of the aspirations of connectivity. So you can be proactive in that way. So don't leave with the clickers even though it didn't work. <laughs> If you're waiting around, I've given up on, on the We'll do it another time. Yeah. Um, it seems like this is um, the natural wrap-up time. 
I will uh, maybe not borrow the mic, please. There's just a few things I'd like to um, ask you to stay just a moment longer. Uh, I want to say that I'm going to try to talk to David about getting his questions onto the yep. website yep. so that you and other people can answer those questions. I'd also like you to feel free to add to this sheet. You don't have to do it tonight. If you want to do it tonight and leave it for us, please do. If you want to add to it, drop it off in the planning department or mail it in. However you'd like to get it to the planning department, please do that. Um, you can uh, address it to, um, my name is longer than Laura's, so I'm going to give you Laura's email address. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll give you mine, but it's a eight-letter eight last name. Um, Laura Wiener, L double. L W E I, what? <laughs> L W I E N E R at town.arlington.ma.us. Um, also, we we hope you will stay engaged in this design guidelines process and in the zoning amendment process. Um, we did ask for your emails. I'm glad that you've given them to us. Um, this is very valuable. Your, everything that I've heard tonight, I appreciate so very much, and I, I really appreciate that you've, you've come out on this um, kind of misty night tonight. Um, I, I hope you will do something else. Right now, um, there are four boards and committees that are related to planning that have committee openings. The Redevelopment Board, the Master Plan Implementation Committee, the um, Community Preservation Act Committee, and a housing advisory committee, which will be just a one-year commitment to help us update the housing plan. Um, all of that information is available on the website, but if you want to get it directly from me, you can contact me in the morning. Um, and so please check. If you aren't subscribed to the town notices, we also send out information about master plan implementation. You'll hear about follow-ups on this presentation if you're subscribed to arlingtonma.gov slash subscriber. Scroll down to the bottom and um, subscribe to Master Plan. So um, do you think we'll be able to get some of those questions on to the, okay. Yeah. And we, we're pretty sure we're gonna work on a survey monkey as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very um, much. Oh, we have another question in the back, Tamara? Not, not really a question actually, but just because you started the question period by asking what the concerns were which really means like, what are we afraid of? And sort of negative things. And I just wanted to just give you guys a really positive <laughs> comment, which is that um, it's really exciting, I think, what we're seeing and the way that you organize the presentation in terms of some of the other places around the country, what the potentials of doing this are. It's just really exciting to think about some of that happening in Arlington. Certainly like along the Millbrook, thinking about that as a walking spine of interesting stuff, it's just really cool. Um, and, and your guidelines are really thoughtful and the sort of notion of being able to shape, um, you know, not just the zoning, but really the physicality of making these places is, I, I applaud you, great, you know, keep going. I just want to say some positive reinforcement and not just what we all fear. So, thank thanks. you. That's great to hear. Thank you, Tamara. So thank you all very much for coming and um, we'll stick around for a little while if you uh, have any individual uh, questions or conversations. Thanks so much. Yeah. Last on the agenda, next on the agenda tonight is a discussion of a walkthrough on the proposed Uger site. So we're, we're taking that last agenda item. So June 23rd, uh, Tuesday, June 23rd at 10 a.m. Um, so we need to determine which board members, if the whole board is um, eligible to attend the site visit because you are, you meet the um, conditions of it being a quote, local board under the um, Code, of Ma Code of Massachusetts Re regulations that governs the 40B. So I just want to be sure of um, who, among the redevelopment board members will attend the site visit. It's uh, Tuesday, June 23rd, 10 a.m. I will, okay, so Andrew will attend. I will attend. I'm going to try to attend. Okay. This is a nice topic on schedule, but I will try to attend.
It is. It's a Tuesday, uh, June 23rd at uh, 10 a.m. on the site. I, I suggest that I let them know that there's a possibility there will be uh, five of us. Uh, that way the board, I'll post it as a site visit. Uh, the board obviously can only receive information and ask questions. You can't deliberate or uh, take any actions or any votes because it will not be a, a meeting. But I will post uh, that the board is uh, conducting a site visit. So. That way, we're covered if the whole board wants to attend the site visit. That sounds, sounds good. And I would only ask, um, you have a meeting on June 22nd, the night before. So if you could, do. you do. Yeah, there is a meeting June 22nd, and we do have several agenda items. Uh, if we could um, just make a point of that evening of updating your, your plans and intentions for the, for the site visit the following day. Yeah, what is uh, we don't have any EDR hearings, but we, um, there is a um, facilities, a study that we'd like to um, tell the board about that we would like to uh, pursue for uh, the renovating the senior center. Andrew Flanagan and um, acting director of public health uh, Jim Feeney would like to come to the redevelopment board and tell you a little bit about what the scope of that and because it's related to the central school which is one of your buildings. Uh, there are two other agenda items but uh, none of them are EDR hearings, no special permit hearings. I think it can be a short meeting, but um, we, we have kind of backed up a few items, so we really should have the meeting. Okay. Any 